Hey there, friend. Welcome back to the Construction Leadership Podcast. I am your host, Bradley Hartman. This episode is brought to you by the Simple Sales Pipeline in the construction industry. It's so critical to have our sales team consistently organizing and valuing their sales pipeline and making forecasts that they are confident in the easiest way to do that. The simplest way to do that is with the Simple Sales Pipeline. It can be done in 30 minutes, once per month, and costs less than $30 per month. You can learn more at thesimplesalespipeline.com. Now, I'm excited to bring to you today my conversation with Mr. Rick Fox. And if that name rings a bell, it should. Maybe you're into sports and you follow the NBA and you know Rick's basketball career, or maybe you watch TVs or movies and you will recognize him from his 25-year career in Hollywood. Now, Rick was born into a competitive, high-achieving family. His mother was a Canadian Olympian, and his father was an entrepreneur. He grew up in the Bahamas. He went to the University of North Carolina, where he was coached by none other than legendary Dean Smith. He was then drafted by the Boston Celtics by none other than Red Auerbach, played several years for Boston, and then ended up going to the LA Lakers. One of the few to have an incredible career on both sides of that incredible rivalry between the Celtics and the Lakers. While on the Lakers, he won three NBA championships. He was a captain on the team. He played with Kobe and Shaq and Phil Jackson and that crew. And then when done with his career, he transitioned almost seamlessly into Hollywood and had a 25 year career. Now, do we talk about sports and do we talk about champions and the mentality of championship teams and how to build stronger teams? Yes. Yes, we do. But that is not why Rick Fox is on the show here today. We're here to talk about his startup called Partana. Partana specializes in making carbon negative concrete. That's right. Concrete that removes carbon from the atmosphere. How do they do that? Well, I had to do a lot of research and figure out what the hell I was talking about because it uses two different waste products. One is brine. Brine comes from the desalination process from removing salt from salt water. And the other one is steel slag, which is a waste product that comes from steel manufacturing. They take two of those as components and make something that is competitive with Portland cement. So Rick gets into all those details And it's really exciting to see Partana being one of the companies that is leading our industry to increase sustainability. So without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Mr. Rick Fox of Partana. As always, thank you for listening. So Mr. Rick Fox, welcome to the show. Thank you. I appreciate you making time here. So it was, I don't know, this was several months ago. Originally, uh, Eric and my team said, hey, it's like, you know, Rick Fox, he's got this carbon negative concrete. He's like, are you aware of this? And I was like, those are two things that I was not anticipating being together in the same sentence. I was like, I didn't even know there was such a thing as carbon negative concrete. It got me thinking a little bit and you, well, you're going to educate us on the product. Um, uh, back in the day, I used to buy drywall and I came upon realizing that uh, uh, about 30% plus percent of all the gypsum used in drywall comes through power plants and a waste product. And I was like, okay, so I've been trying to get educated on this so I can have a intelligent conversation with you, but maybe let's just start with, you got a lot of stuff going on in your life. Where does this opportunity come from that you say, this is it. I'm doubling down. I'm going to lead this team and really commit to this. Walk me through that story from the beginning. So for me personally, I guess you would start with what is Rick Fox doing in concrete or <laughs> sure. didn't know Rick Fox was a material scientist. <laughs> right. All of the above is probably completely a surprise to your audience here. Uh, and they should be surprised because it surprised me when it happened. I come from a background of professional sports, the entertainment industry, TV and movies, I became an entrepreneur in the gaming industry of video games about eight years ago. And that transition, albeit a background in my life growing up as my dad was an entrepreneur and built the first ice factory in the Bahamas, um, entrepreneurship was something in my, that was in my blood, but I didn't foresee it being uh, something of a path in construction or in this case, climate technology, where we are de- deconstructing uh, pollution from development. Uh, that mission was a surprise 
that entered my uh, my life back in 2019. So if we go back to 2019, I've already made the transition into the business phase and entrepreneurship phase of my life. I was in the gaming industry, building a video game company, and the world shut down. Mm -hmm. The world shut down at a point in time where we, we weren't able to move around. Uh, this was fresh at the top of 2020. I had an opportunity as we were locked down. My manager called me and she introduced me to my co-founding partner, Sam Marshall, an architect by trade, an award-winning uh, global success in that field. He himself had personally been on a journey for about five years uh, where he was trying to, to shift the way construction cost impact architectural design. Mm -hmm. And he had shut down his firm, his architectural firm, and started traveling the world. And he had the theory that if 20% of the world uses only uses or can afford Portland cement, well, what's the other 80% of the world doing? And it was at that point in time that he traveled for about a year. He came back with a couple theses. He actually in, in, engaged with two of the top concrete innovators in the United States out of Minnesota. And those two people, uh, along with Sam, sat down for about a year and a half and worked on this theory. Long story short, uh, they struck lightning in a bottle. Um, having, having recognized what they did, they began the patent process. And I entered the equation in the middle at the top of COVID where I was connected, like I said, by my manager to begin the conversation. And I'll never forget what she said to me. You have to meet my friend. He has concrete that acts like a tree. And the two for me, <laughs> I couldn't grasp how that would work right. uh, outside of the fact that for me, running the streets of Wilshire from Westwood all the way down to the beach in LA, I would always run the sidewalks and I'd always see trees that were planted in the sidewalks that were busting out of the concrete. Mm -hmm. So I, I always thought the two didn't get along because I was always watching my footing so I didn't sprain an ankle. So when she said that, it grabbed my attention and I decided that it was worth at least some exploratory sit downs mm -hmm. to understand exactly how concrete could act like a tree. And what she was really getting at was that Sam and uh, the individuals that are on the patents that had innovated this, this uh, binder, which at the end of the day, we all know what cement is. Mm -hmm. Cement is, we've been burning cement rocks for 200 years and it creates clinker and it emits a, yep. an exorbitant amount of CO2 into the atmosphere to get to a finished product that is concrete, that is very beneficial for our development in the world. We've been doing it for 200 years, but we never thought for a second to ask the question maybe, why are we continually burning rocks for 200 years? Is there another way? Now, we're not the smartest people in the room, especially me. Like I said, I'm not the material scientist. I actually did, though, play one on the Big Bang Theory. So maybe something rubbed <laughs> off at the time that I was playing a, a material scientist on the Big Bang Theory. But more, more times than not, I happen to be the member on the team that actually knows how to build winning teams. I was invited to be the co-founder and partner of Partana Global with Sam at, at a certain point after about eight months of me gr grabbing a, sem a semblance of, under, of an understanding of the material science, but trusting, quite frankly, Sam and his, his partners that had been doing this for five years. Mm -hmm. and, and in that, I really saw a mission for this phase in my life uh, that had more value than anything else I could be doing. I've been an athlete at the highest level, won championships, played with the Celtics, played with the Lakers, uh, won three championships, uh, and then transitioned into Hollywood for 25 years, where I've worked on with the best in the business, in front and behind the camera. But in this moment in my life, when the world had stopped, and I always say two things, two great things came out of COVID for me personally. One, I got really close to my kids. Uh, I answered a lot of questions that I probably wouldn't have answered until I was on my deathbed. I answered them early mm -hmm. for them, which built a greater bond for us. And then second of all, I discovered this material and its need to reach the world and its impact that it can have on the world. And so I literally, when asked by Sam to stop what I was doing and commit my life to this, it took me about three weeks to make that decision. Uh, but in the end, I thought it was the best way for me in this phase going forward in my life to leave a legacy 
to have a mission that's greater than any mission I could have individually, uh, uh, individual accomplishment in sports or entertainment or in business, and to really be a steward, as we like to say here at Partana. I'm simply a steward of this, this technology, uh, and our job is to get it in the hands of the right people, to get it to the world as fast as possible so that we can generate the most good uh, that needs to happen in the construction industry. Oh, that that's helpful. And you, you mentioned Clinker. I've, I will tell you, we've done 300, I don't know, 70 some odd episodes here. I've never started reading patents, trying to figure out, and by the way, pulled up that patent. I'm like, I don't know what the hell this is, but Clinker and understanding <laughs> really how Portland cement is made and then understanding brine. I kind of had an idea that brine was a vocabulary word that was connected to the sea, but I didn't know how. So would you mind giving us just a, an overview for the audience on, I think people right away, Portland cement. Yep. I know exactly what that is. And that's been here forever. It's going to be here forever. Meanwhile, you're saying, Hey, we're going to, we're going to introduce how we're going to leverage, you know, some steel slag and some brine to do something very different. And maybe talk about this, this, I think the most unique attribute, which is it's carbon negative. So can you talk to a little bit yeah. about that? So I will begin from a foundational place in business where if you're in the construction industry and you've been doing business a certain way uh, successfully, mm -hmm. change is not something that I'm sure you would be interested in making at this stage of your, your business model, right? It works. We, we use cement, we create concrete, we build buildings. Hey, it all works. We have our subs, our, uh, our, our system in place. And, and so for us to enter the, the, the conversation at this stage in the world where a lot of, of what has been call, called upon for the construction industry, and as, you, as I'm sure you've seen this, these numbers presented to you, the construction industry is responsible for 38% yeah. of all the negative emissions out here in the, in, in, uh, in, the, in the planet, right? So, and if you drill down from that number and you get to cement, cement is contributing anywhere from six to 9% of the negativity. Now, why is that? Well, so much of the energy uh, right. uh, that goes into making cement emits that negativity into the atmosphere. And, and, and look, development's not going anywhere. We're not going to stop developing. If anything, construction is going to double in the next few years here in all the usual spots, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it be the U.S. or China or India or in the Middle East, especially. Right. That's, you know, development is happening all around us, okay? So if you look at those emissions and we as a planet, whether you're a climate believer or denier, what you can't deny is that Tackling a more sustainable approach to the way we build is, I, I think it, you'd be hard pressed to say that's a negative thing. Now, when we usually have innovation, the thing where innovation falls by the wayside is whether or not it's value add or value innovation or not, right? Mm -hmm. Most green solutions or sustainable right. solutions end up costing more than the traditional route that we take, right? And that's where they fall by the wayside. I will break down cement or concrete for you in two ways. You, you guys here in the construction industry understand concrete. You guys currently make it uh, with cement. Cement is a binder. Mm -hmm. For the audience out there that's hearing this for the first time and know nothing about concrete, think of cement as a glue, right? Cement is that binder that glues concrete together. Aggregate, water, every other thing that's used to get to the concrete, cement is that glue. We pull the glue out and we put our own glue and plug it into to get to our concrete, okay? Now, how do we get our Partana binder mix? We take waste materials. You mentioned slag. You mentioned brine. If you don't know what slag is, slag is a byproduct of the steel industry. Mm -hmm. Brine is a byproduct of the desalination industry. Mm -hmm. Both of them being waste materials that if can be used for better environmentally good products, you would say, hey, Let's grab up all the slag in the world. Let's grab up all the brine. Let's turn it into something good. Mm -hmm. Well, we've been able to come up with IP and a solution that does exactly that. We take those two products, we put them together, and they're not in any way new products that have been used to create concrete. There's Sorel cements, there's slag-based cements. We've seen these before. Before, 200 years ago, when we, were, we started burning rocks, you look, you look at the Great Wall of China. You look at the Roman Colosseums. These are Sorel, these are base cements, concretes that have been around 
that were put in place before for cement. So it's possible to actually generate a finished concrete without the use of clinker. We have done it, but we've done it using waste materials in a process that when you think of, okay, well, how do you get to the concrete? Our waste materials come together using the power of chemistry, right? And so through the process, as it changes and becomes a new compound, the CO2 is used to activate the end result. But the CO2, when it once it enters in this process, crystallizes and changes forever, hmm. becomes a, a different finished product. And when you grind that product up, up, it doesn't release into the atmosphere. It just becomes aggregate again. Okay. So you get a finished concrete that avoids all of the negative emissions in its process and creation. And also through the removal of that CO2 to, to, in the process of becoming a concrete, we absorb CO2 out of the atmosphere. So we avoid and remove doing a positive thing, but we do it without any energy intensive nature. We know we use no Portland cement in our process and we know we use no energy in our process. We direct air cure at an ambient room temperature. So you're talking about we mix our stuff together, we sit it out there and it cures directly in room temperature, ambient outdoor air. So that's, that's the beauty of what we're doing. And it's getting traction now because on par with any concrete that's ever been made with cement, and in some cases, some of our products are 25% stronger than, a, say, a, C, a, a cement CMU block. Sure. We're 25% stronger. And in the case of ready mix and pour, we get the strengths quicker than you would get to, this, to a cement-based concrete unless you are adding some mm -hmm. additive that we don't need to add to get to the result that we get to. Yeah. So I'm curious about like the supply chain with, with the brine and the steel slag. Yes. Will that necessitate that you guys are setting up shop, whether it's a, a big old factory that I can't quite imagine, but something large or something like kind of a, a mini ghost kitchen to do this. Does this require you to be close to a desalination plant? It helps. <laughs> Transportation and logistics kill okay. everything in the construction industry, right? Yeah. Uh, when we, when we, I'll give you a funny story. It'll maybe, maybe, hopefully, some people will get a kick out of this, uh, so they won't feel alone. During COVID, you know, we started manufacturing our first uh, products overseas, and we got hit with the twenty five thousand dollar a container price. <laughs> so we we learned rather quickly that even though we were building pavers from our material that we thought we would sell into the U.S. market, $25,000 container prices kind of kill your margins. So it's a, there's a reason in the construction industry why batch plants right. and products are produced and materials are produced within a 100-mile radius of where they're used. And that's predominantly because of transportation and logistics. So mm -hmm. when you look at our, our products that we're using to make our finished good, yeah, Close to close to a, a land a landfill that has slag or or a steel factory that has slag within a short amount of radius is good. Um, brine desalination plants within a short radius is good um, because then that transportation cost lowers and we're able to build a factory in a in a centralized location that would pull from those those um, sources of, of materials. Uh, and if we have to, we can buy them. We can buy these materials. We have models that work where we're still profitable, even if we're buying these commodities. Okay. Um, but in most cases, both of these are waste materials where uh, companies will pay you to take them away. Uh, and they've been paying people to remove these products for years. There's no shortage of them in the world. Steel factories aren't going anywhere. And desalination plants are, start, are going to be triple the size and yeah. the amount of them by the year 2025. Yeah. So... Here we are finding ourselves in regions like the Bahamas because they're high in desalination usage in the Middle East, high in desalination mm -hmm. usage where we can find a lot of brine. Yeah. So w one thing that I, I wasn't super familiar of, I, I know there's more focus on this just given how much uh, negative impact concrete in general, Portland cement specifically, uh, Engineer News Record had an article about LC3. And again, I know nothing about this, but limestone, limestone calcium clay cement, which a lot of it seemed somewhat similar. How much competition is there beyond Portland uh, of just innovative new things that would, in theory, 
compete saying, hey, this is something different than, than Portland? Well, I would I would start off by giving the analogy that innovation is not is 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 not new, right? Uh, we're always looking at industry and we're looking to involve the, evolve them and innovate them to better standards, better strengths, better quality of, of, of product. You look at three G to four G and now five G right. in the telephone industry, right? You look at the electric automobile industry. You go from fossil fuel cars to now a small percentage of them are electric vehicles. Right. These are all industries that have been around for centuries. They're not going anywhere. The fossil fuel car is not going anywhere. Right. <laughs> Anytime soon. Neither is Portland cement. So when we enter the market as or our or other industries, I mean, other um, companies that are looking to innovate around concrete. Um, yes, there's you see fly ash. You see uh, individuals that are all looking for a better finished concrete with less negative impact on our environment, right? With greater properties, greater solutions. Um, but again, we can't scale quick enough. Um, none of these new innovations can scale quick enough to make concrete shudder in their shoes of, 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 sure. about, being, about being replaced, right? Yeah. Um, look, con cement concrete has great properties for the way it's used. If I'm going to build a skyscraper, I want to know that whatever I'm using has been around for 200 years. Mm. You don't see Partana stepping in today talking about let's build a skyscraper with our material, right? Yeah. We want to move in steps that over time we become that trusted material that is an option if you're looking for a concrete that has less emissions, mm. right? So we align ourselves with the thinking of the way the electric vehicle came to market. Now, what did what did Tesla survive that, that climb for themselves would help that? their ability to, to actually capitalize off of the carbon credits which gave them yeah. a, a, an, asset, an asset line item mm -hmm. in their bottom line that supported their growth, right? Yeah. The beauty of Partana is through the creation of our materials, we too generate carbon credits. We create avoidance credits and we create removal credits, which become an added value line item of revenue that we can either pass on to our customers or we can use to include... Uh, our growth at capex levels, where we have to build factories and and continue to grow our 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 offerings in different regions, right? So the 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 innovation is there. Um, I see it all over the place. What I will make a point for you uh, and your audience to be clear on is when you see Partana currently today, and we're we're proud of it, but we we hope it changes quickly because we can't be the only people. Um, that are trying to solve the problem around uh, emissions and concrete. Um, but we're the only answer right now currently in carbon negative concrete. Yeah. We're the first company that's, can, that's avoiding and removing CO2 through the process of making concrete. Yeah. No one else is doing that. Now, there are a lot of people out there that are doing direct air capture carbon sequestration. So you have the carbon cures, you have the um, uh, carbon crete. Uh, I've the brimstones and we see some other companies that are moving in the area of, of solution based. Um, we call them the less bad crew, right? <laughs> They're doing less bad. So we celebrate yeah. them for minimizing the impact, but they haven't fully got to the yeah. just simply good yet. Right? right. So we think they'll get there. We hope they get there as fast as possible because we want we want as many of these solutions out there in the world. We right now are just simply good. Yeah. We don't we don't use energy intensive to get to a one to one. We do one step forward, one step back. That's what the less bad crew does. Right. They do one step forward and then one step back. Less so if crew. they're absorbing CO2, they're using a bunch of energy to do it. Yeah. And so it's like, is it a wash? Is it really actually doing good? And so we challenge them. And, and uh, in that regard, to find new ways to use energy that's greener, maybe. Because if they use greener energy, maybe that supports the the message. Uh, but we're not carbon sequestration. Yep. Please don't confuse us with that. Um, we are one of one right now currently. Um, and uh, I'm sure others will come behind us. But right now, no one's doing what we're doing. Cool. Maybe I can, uh, I'm going to ask you quickly about what you're doing with Red Sea Global. And then before you go, I want to make sure uh, I'm a basketball nerd. So I got a couple of questions on leadership and that. So tell us what's happening with... Red Sea Global, I know it's, it's part of the public investment fund of Saudi Arabia. That's just transforming yeah. so many aspects of, well, not only sport, but also construction in the Middle East and all that. So this was relatively new, or you guys fill me in, uh, relatively new. What's been happening? Yeah, sure. What's the excitement there? 
Yeah. So, uh, you know, the last three years we we were born in in the U.S. as a Delaware entity with, uh, like I said, Amer- an American co-founder. I'm, a, I'm from the Bahamas. Um, we we were developed and we grew through COVID. So there wasn't a whole lot of movement around the world at that time. Um, when the world opened up, we we explored uh, a location of how we could set up a factory on a port that was going to be cost effective to us as a, a startup company. We were blessed to have the support of the, uh, the prime minister of the Bahamas, who just come back from COP26. And it was at his uh, speech at COP26 that he called on developing nations to be accountable for the impact impact they were having on low-lying developing nations like the Bahamas, who were repeatedly finding ourselves in debt from the recovery base, yeah. um, hurricane uh, issues that we face on a yearly or sometimes, you know, twice or three times a year basis. Um, so so for, for us, being here was about going to the front line of climate change. It was about finding the people who were about innovation and didn't feel they had time to innovate. They were about action and less talk. Um, so that's why we're here. We, we're here in the Bahamas. We have 10 acres on the port uh, here in the country, capital city, where we're building our first our first factory, as well as a thousand homes that are affordable in the country. So we have a commitment to the government of the Bahamas. It was at COP uh, 27 in Egypt back in November of uh, about seven months ago that we introduced this partnership to the world. And it was at the same time that we met John Pagano, CEO of the Red Sea Global, who is building a, a development the size of Belgium, uh, who has a sustainable commitment who too said the same thing to me at COP, which was enough of the talk. We are about leading with action. And if what you're doing is what we believe is possible, then we need to be, we need to be in a collaboration and a partnership that's using your material in our development. We signed an MOU. We announced that to the world uh, back at the end of the year last year. And, and since then we've spent the first four months of this year uh, developing a path forward and now we are actually on the ground at the Red Sea Global, executing and delivering in a manufacturing fashion pavers for uh, the world's largest uh, nursery yeah. uh, in in the region at the Red Sea Global. It's also opened up doors where we'll announce. I don't know when the podcast is airing, but we, we have an announcement in about 10 days of another Giga project that we are working with. And a third uh, that should be able to be announced by the end of of uh, the year. So we have uh, we have found ourselves in the heart of a region where construction is is probably 60 or 80 percent of the world's construction is happening in the kingdom and in that region right now. Um, so we go where we're wanted and needed. They have a very uh, focused uh, sus- uh, sustainability mission of making sure that these these gigger projects are are accountable for the the input that that they're generating in the missions, mm-hmm. and so we we fit in by bringing these building materials to these projects uh, that reduce and eliminate their out their their emissions, and so that's exciting. The U.S. is coming on market. I don't want the U.S. to feel left out um, because that's been exciting the last two months. Uh, and you mentioned a friend of mine uh, um, at Fred at Beck Construction. We've been having conversations about your very region in Dallas. The impact of what these materials could mean for projects in Texas, Uh, out of Houston. We have developers, home builders that we have relationships with that are interested in actually setting up a factory to feed their their projects. So very forward thinking uh, the state of Texas has has been in leadership in that regard. And I think in the U.S. market by the end of the year, early quarter one of 2024, we'll be set up with probably two factories in the U.S. So we're on the move. We're a global company rather quickly in the span of three years. We're drinking through a fire hose of opportunity, which is a good problem to have. But uh, I think it's just keeping our heads down, staying focused, finding finding countries, developers, builders who care about this vertical being a sliver in their offering of, 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 of materials. If you saw recently um, in the government, the federal government, just mentioned uh, the initiative around green building materials being implemented into the procurement portals Hmm. so that if state developments use these materials, the federal government will fund the development uh, of those projects at state levels as long as they use these materials that are green. So we hope to be in 
a procurement position of added to that list by the end of the year. Wow. That's awesome. Well, that's, that's exciting. Um, again, I'm watching the time here. I, I, here's what I'm going to run down a few names here. I want you to think about what are some of the leadership principles amongst these people that might differentiate them from other people who might be listening. Dean Smith, Roy Williams, Larry Bird, Kevin McHale, Robert Parrish, Dominique Wilkins, M.O. Carr, Kobe, Shaq, Dennis Rodman, uh, Phil Jackson, Carl Malone, Gary Payton. You played for or with yeah. those lists of absolute legends. This is a construction leadership yeah. podcast. What's maybe, is there something non-obvious? Because I'm sure the list of like, Hard work, focus, passion, you know, care. I'm sure there's a list of all, a lot of these things that are really obvious that they all share. Is there anything maybe non-obvious that you'd like to kind of share with the audience of just your experience playing with this number of absolute legends in the game? Yeah, I can talk this. I can talk this for an hour, man. I wish we I wish we we had an hour to talk it. Um, you started off with the one person that's probably had the greatest impact mm. in my life as a basketball player, but also as a student athlete and someone outside of the arena. And that was Dean Smith. He gave uh, three principles on a daily basis for us. Play smart, um, um, play hard and play together. Uh, that was something that I, I incorporated in life in general. I, I'm grateful for my father, who was an example of action, very stoic just went about his day, suited up, showed up. Sometimes the hardest thing to do when you when life is just delivering you, you know, the toughest blows is can you still uh, have a mind over matter or mind over the moment? And so the thing that's unique about each of those individuals that isn't celebrated as much, whether they were a coach like Phil Jackson or a player, coach was, Phil was a coach and a player, but you mentioned the likes of, Kobe and Shaq, the likes of Larry Bird, Kevin McHale, Robin Parrish. I mean, you went on a long list, Jerry West. Uh, my bloodline of mentors and mm. teammates rank up there with the best. Yeah. Michael Jordan was a mentor of mine for two years. I lived in his house as a college kid in the summers, working his basketball camp. He gave me the first glimpse of what I thought was a limit, and that was him jumping on a treadmill, same treadmill I had just gotten off of, and watching him run at the maximum on that treadmill for three minutes at a time, like, and I, it just, the, the, the limits with which you can push your mind, your body to reach heights that even you as a professional athlete might think are possible. I always tell people all the time, I was probably one of the best 400 athletes in the world at basketball for 13 years. Okay. That's a long time. But there were teammates of mine, and you named a lot of them, that played for 20 years. Mm. They, they were Hall of Famers, the best of the best. I wasn't one of them. I was, I was a championship coach. I mean, a, a, a captain. I led, I led teams to championship-level success for three years. Um, but from the shoulders up, every single one of them would smash the dumb jock uh, uh, you know, label. Right. In other words, it, you'd find them to be some of the most detailed, oriented, driven, focused. They see things, they process things at a speed that's unfathomable. Um, they have a willingness to go to heights uh, and limits that people would normally pause and not push through. They have an ability to have a mind over body that to block out the pain, the discomfort and still push through. And I'll say the one thing we were all cursed with, and whether it was a father or a mother or some mentor along the way in all of our lives, uh, we were cursed with both positively and negatively. It's that gene of it's not enough. Mm -hmm. You haven't done enough. You could do more. And in my case, it was my mom. She was an Olympic athlete. Yeah. And I could never, even to this day, impress her enough with what I'm doing. So you wonder why I've gone from <laughs> NBA championship lores to uh, you know Emmy and Oscar winning sets to 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 uh the world of climate entrepreneur. It's just like I can I can always do more. I can always evolve to new heights. And if you can be a beginner in every room you walk into, if you can wash away the shame that comes with uh, with uh, comes with not knowing and allow yourself to learn from the youngest person to the most experienced person in every environment you're in, 
and you look at every day as a new day of yourself becoming a better version of that thing you're doing, man, put yourself in a beginner position every day. Mm -hmm. Don't see yourself as an expert. Look at yourself as someone that can pick up and learn something from someone around you to that takes you to a new level. That's that's the thing from Al Rhodes, my high school coach, to Dean Smith, the greatest college basketball coach in my mind ever, to Red Arback, who drafted me with his cigar smoking Ooh, that had to come to my defense on draft night when I was booed, to Larry Bird and Kevin McHale and Robert Parrish, who I was a rookie to those three guys yeah. that raised me, to... Jerry West, who came and recruited me to come to the Lakers, to Phil Jackson and Dr. Buss and Shaq and Kobe. And I just, I had a blessed environment. And I'll leave you with this, because I can talk, like I said, for an hour on this. What I'll leave you with is that in all those cases, it's good to identify, are you a team sport or an individual, are you a team athlete or an individual athlete? Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, for me, the greatest joy I get in life is serving my teammates and celebrating our successes together because there's no greater joy than winning something or reaching the highest heights and having people that you love and work so hard with to celebrate with. Mm -hmm. It's a lonely locker room when it's just you. Yeah. So if you're an individual athlete, learn how to become a team athlete. You'll go a lot further that way and you'll get a lot more done. I've never seen a house built by one person. That's it. Well, I think I'm going to go out and shoot some hoops with my kids right now. I'm all, I'm all pumped. I'm Jack. So, hey, um, I appreciate you making time. Um, what you are, I think what you're doing with Partana, like this is exciting. It's new and it's different. Uh, we're rooting for you and excited to see everything you guys got coming down the line. Um, so I appreciate you. Thank, thank you for making time. And thank um, you so much. If, uh, if our audience wants to learn more, wants to reach out, is interested in how they might partner with, with you, whether they're residential, whether a sub, contractor, where would you recommend uh, they go for an immediate next step? I, I would reach out to partana.com. Okay. Um, our website has, uh, we, we have the incoming, uh, as I mentioned, from from developers, from from cement companies, you name it, from uh, product uh, creation and precast companies. We're, we have a lot of incoming right now, but I promise you, if you are committed to using uh, these the materials that will will put you in a category that of leadership in your business model uh, and unlock your offering to your customers that will, de will deliver uh, added value through the carbon credit conversation that we can generate. I'll give you a quick example. 70 CMU blocks of our product equal a carbon credit. So if you know anything about carbon credits, that means that's extra revenue hmm. in a collaborative arrangement between us and our partners who are using our materials. So there's a lot that we can bring. We don't just innovate for you. We bring value innovation. And when I talk about the cost of our products, that's one thing we didn't talk about. We are on par and depending on our scale of volume of partnership, we can be less than cement. Hmm. So, it, you know, the, the more we are using and the more we're building uh, material wise in our factories, that we can uh, we can actually not only generate carbon credits, but our volume of pricing gets even below uh, that of cement. Cool. I'm, I'm glad you, it's the construction industry. We know it's, things are volatile in terms of commodity pricing. So addressing the price objection, yeah. I think that's a, it's a great yeah. spot to end. Hey, I appreciate your time and uh, best of luck. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, friends, how did that go? Hopefully you enjoyed my conversation with Mr. Rick Fox. Now, after we switched off the mics, we had a little bit of a discussion as the video and audio was uploading. And I happened just to kind of throw out that I had assembled my top five all-time Canadian NBA players, and Rick was absolutely on it at number two. And I asked him to, off the top of his head, come up with his top five. And that ended up being like a 10 or 11 minute conversation. That was an absolute blast talking about sports with him. But again, I'm really excited uh, for the future of Partana and other companies like that, that are getting real creative and are really bringing in new innovation to increase sustainability and find different ways for us to build not only America, but the globe. So if you enjoyed this, uh, do us a quick favor, whatever podcast platform you are listening to this on, please rate and review us. That means more to us than you know. And of course, if you want to find more on Partana, you should absolutely check that out. P-A-R-T-A-N-N-A. -N -N -A 
carbonnegative.com, Cortana, to learn more about carbon negative concrete. All right, friends, that is all I've got. This has been a joy. I appreciate you investing the time, energy, and attention. So with that, we're going to close out like we always do with our leadership mantra. You, my friend, are owed nothing. Deliver value first. Make it a great week.